One of the most bizarre resort developments I've ever seen, Kelowna Mountain has quite a history that seems to be ever evolving and changing. But the place truly is weird. For example, where can you find a ski resort mixed with four suspension bridges, a wine cave, vineyards, ponds, an underground climbing wall, and a sundial all in one? Well, here's where. Despite its location and history, I found that most people have never heard of Kelowna Mountain. However, the bizarre history and story is extremely unique and deserves a spot on the Lost Resorts. So, without further ado, sit back and please enjoy the story of Kelowna Mountain. Kelowna Mountain is unlike its competitors in pretty much every way. To start, we need to wind back to 2003. In 2003, the Okanagan Mountain Park forest fire ripped through the mountains directly southwest of the city of Kelowna. The fire threatened the Upper Mission neighborhood, and unfortunately, quite a few homes were lost to the blaze. Now, in 2007, a local developer named Mark Consiglio came into the picture. Consiglio purchased 640 acres of burnt mountain land that sat directly south of the Upper Mission neighborhood. Consiglio had grand plans that spanned far beyond the ski resort. He envisioned not only a ski hill, but a golf course, four suspension bridges, multiple vineyards, a wine cave, welcome center, and 55 single-family residential units. The project was undoubtedly huge, and the ski resort was offered more as an amenity rather than as an attraction of its own. To finance this enormous project, Consiglio brought in many investors, some international but many local Kelowna residents. To invest in this project, investors either paid Consiglio $40,000 or $150,000. Now, save these numbers because we'll come back to this later. By 2009, Consiglio was well underway with construction. Roads were built, ponds were created, boardwalks were laid, a sundial was built, a cave was dug, ski runs were graded, and a welcome center at the top, the crown jewel of Kelowna Mountain, was constructed. The triple chairlift was installed around 2011 to 2012. This was a used hall triple chair that came from Sunshine Village in Alberta. At Sunshine, it operated as the strawberry chair. To modernize the lift, Lintner Palma was brought in to construct a new bottom terminal and provide lifting frames for the chair. By the time the first closure hit Kelowna Mountain, the lift was mostly complete and it even was used in January of 2012 for Consiglio and his friends in the night. However, things were about to change. While Consiglio had been pushing the development full steam ahead, things were not looking good in the background. You see, Consiglio had never actually changed the zoning the property sat on from its prior state. This meant that while he was allowed to construct his vision, he could not actually open it to the public. Consiglio was expecting to build it now and gain the zonings at a later time when the community was more warmed up to the idea. The problem was the South Slope's official community plan. According to gov.bc.ca, an official community plan describes the long-term vision of community during development. While local governments don't have to adopt an official community plan, if they choose to, all bylaws enacted and work must be consistent with the plan. So, the regional district of Central Okanagan wasn't exactly keen on Kelowna Mountain. So, they drafted an official community plan that would have severely limited any developments in the mountains above our permission. Specifically mentioned was that Kelowna Mountain would be put under intense environmental reviews that could lead to the company being forced to remove all assets from the mountain. To become official, the official community plan needed to gain approval from City Hall. On May 15, 2012, around 200 pro-Kelowna Mountain supporters flooded the public hearings. Regardless, the City Council adopted the OCP by a vote of 10 to 2. One day later, Kelowna Mountain laid off all its workers and remained closed to the public. In 2013, the BC Securities Commission became involved in the development, demanding that Consiglio pay back millions to the investors who paid him either $40,000 or $150,000. A cease trade order was placed against Kelowna Mountain, which halted any further share sales. Despite the setback, Consiglio vowed to move on with the development, claiming that it would be completed sometime soon. By 2014, things were looking up for Consiglio as the BC Securities Commission removed the cease trade order. Subsequently, the mountain announced that it would open to the public. However, the good news did not last long, as in 2014, Kelowna Mountain was sued for $8 million over a mortgage dispute. Additionally, a suspension bridge and the Welcome Center were both heavily vandalized at this time. In 2016, Kelowna Mountain was placed in foreclosure. Obviously, Consiglio appealed the decision, 
placing the mountain again in legal limbo. Despite this, he actually opened the mountain in 2016, installing barbed wire and hiring security with dogs to keep out trespassers and vandals. Though Consiglio appealed the foreclosure order, in 2017, a higher court affirmed it, ruling against Kelowna Mountain. Consiglio was forced to list part of the mountain for sale. Nonetheless, Consiglio somehow managed to retain ownership of the property through paying back debtors. This was reportedly financed through another development of his. Since then, the project has remained in a half-constructed state. When I visited it in 2019, the Welcome Center was operational, but nothing else was. Since then, the mountain has been completely closed off due to renovations, though seemingly the development will go nowhere anytime soon. But now, let's talk about the ski hill. Kelowna Mountain's ski layout is completely bizarre, to say the least. I still don't understand how this area was thought to be a good ski area. Anyway, the mountain had a 150 meter vertical drop and around 15 marked runs. There was both parking lots at the bottom and the top. Let's start by discussing the triple chair. This triple chair had three unloading stations, one here, one here, and the ending. Now, it seems that the first mid station serviced the majority of the ski terrain with around a 68 meter vertical drop. The main run here was the Dreamer Blue Run. This would have actually been an enjoyable, albeit short blue cruiser with a decent pitch. Other easily accessible trails off the first mid station include the flat Damolition Green, the CC Rider Green, the short Tuck Blue, the longer Ties Turn Green, the Tricky Mickey Blue, and the only black diamond at the resort, Carson's Quad. The black run is genuinely steep with an average slope gradient of 15%. Moving upward toward the second mid station, things start to get a bit more confusing. The run, DOS Leap of Faith, starts near the wine cave, but doesn't actually end anywhere interesting. Strangely, there are two blue runs that start from the sundial, called Pop and Via Vineyard. I'm not sure how skiers are supposed to access these apart from hiking, but the width of these ski runs also looks ridiculously small. It's worth mentioning that there was supposed to be a rope tow that serviced a terrain park. This rope tow would have been connected to the second mid station of the chairlift and serviced the DOS Leap of Faith run. Finally, from the top of the chair, the Nick Snick run takes skiers all the way down under the bridges and past the ponds. There are two green runs that branch off this run, those being Cliffhanger and Surwa. Apart from looking extremely flat, it appears that the Surwa run runs along the Axis Road, so it's overall just a confusing and unintuitive layout. I would also imagine that these two green runs would be pretty flat. When looking at the competition, I just can't imagine who would have skied here. With Big White and even Crystal Mountain being so close, I have no clue how Consiglio thought a ski resort at a low elevation with its unintuitive terrain layout would have been viable. Kelowna Mountain is just a weird place overall. The story and the general mountain itself are just plain confusing. Ultimately, even if Consiglio had fully built out the operation, I doubt the ski area would have lasted long. The competition is simply so much better, and the low elevation of Kelowna Mountain would have put the ski area at a huge disadvantage. Ultimately though, the story of the entire mountain itself and of Consiglio is a unique and bizarre story that seems to be ever evolving and changing. Thanks for watching this video! If you enjoyed it, please consider subscribing to my channel. And until next time, this is Skier72.